Welcome to this OST2 course. We're going to talk about when to integrate a trusted platform module in your systems. Because there are so many use cases for a TPM nowadays, and I have personally experienced a trend in using TPM on embedded systems, would that be a medical device? Would that be Internet of Things device or even aerospace? It is easier and better to name when it is not preferable to use a TPM. There are only three major situations where this could occur. Therefore, in all other scenarios, I would advise that the TPM can be a good fit for hardware security in your product. So let's start. The TPM does not offer just cryptographic functions and secure storage, but also protection against physical tampering, protection against side channel attacks, and so much more. Therefore, by design, the TPM made a trade-off, security over speed. While this is true, and some people know it, often comes up the question, okay, but give us a sense of what is the performance like? And this is a fair question. The best resource I have found in my career is the benchmarking done with the Wolf TPM software stack. We've mentioned this stack in earlier lectures. It's one of several well-known open source TPM software libraries. Here I've taken the public data that's published on the Wolf TPM uh, GitHub repo and I have created a brief table. In green, we can see the best performance among the listed TPMs. Um, I have selected the top two in each category. Also important is to note when these models came uh, to the market. Uh, as you could see, for example, at the beginning of the table, we have Infineon SLB 9670 and the new model 9672. The old model came about 2015, 2016. The new model came, I think, um, end of 2021 and was mass available last year, so 2022. And we can see the improvements. And this is also true for the last entry in the table, the Nations Technology Z32 TPM, which is a Chinese manufacturer, so it is not widely available. Typically, this is used only in China. And it is, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was released in around 2019. Therefore, it also benefited from some advancements. And as you could see, it offers a good performance. So in our table, the latest um, from Infineon SOB9672 and the more recent Nation Stake Z32 outperformed the rest, in my opinion, because they were released last. So they benefit most from the technology advancements. However, there are common metrics here. I'll need to highlight how much time it takes to generate a primary key with RSA. And this is indeed a significant amount of time. While this might discourage at first some of you to consider using a TPM, you need to know that this operation does not happen often. And even if it does, we have a way to persist the key so we don't have to recreate it every time between operations. And also once the key is created, it's easier to load it, especially if uh, let's say we, we wanna work more with the public part of the key pair and so on and so on. So these operations are indeed time expensive compared to what we are used nowadays with uh, CPUs in our laptops and uh, maybe some more powerful smartphones. At the same time, here we get more security and not so much speed. And this is intentional. And that's a good thing because we're talking about security here. Now, if we look at the ECC keys, asymmetric keys, the picture changes radically because ECC, it's so much uh, more modern. It's even embedded friendly. And um, as you probably know, it's a very preferred choice for the Internet of Things and small devices, memory constrained devices. And here we get a more performance out of the TPM, although it is not designed for that. So using the TPM with ECC for devices in the field is great, in my opinion. It, it offers us high grade of security at a very good performance level. Because again, these operations do not happen that often. Here we have the ECDCA sign and verify operations for digital signatures. And the scheme, uh, just to mention it, is uh, for ECC is the curve for ECC is uh, P256. Now you can also do hash operations and you can use the TPM as a random uh, number generator as a source of randomness, of true randomness. Of course, this comes at a specific bandwidth. So 
this needs to be taken into account depending on your application. It is just that if you're thinking of using the TPM as a cryptographic accelerator, just looking at these numbers, you already know this is not a good idea. This is not a good fit for your case. And that's okay because the TPM is meant for security, not speed. This will be a recurring theme in the lectures uh, because it is important and people are used to getting some sort of cryptographic accelerators along with the security features. Here, we really focus on the security matter. Another typical scenario is that once we start using the GPM, we see its benefits and then we try to use it for everything. Of course, this is extremely difficult because of the limitations in memory size. And again, this comes down to cost and this comes down to the fact that the TPM building, cutting out a TPM chip, the physical chip, costs money the more memory it has. So the TPM has enough memory for critical data, for uh, would it be certificates, would it be keys, would it be some other form of secrets or configuration system device user up to your requirements. It is a mistake and I've seen that to try to fit everything inside the TPM's non-volatile memory because it simply cannot fit there. Now, there is a trend of including more and more memory because of customer's demand and on different needs as the Internet of Things landscape grows. And we've seen this. The old Infineon TPM model had only 7 kilobytes and of course there were variants later that went up I think to almost 24 at one point, depending on the variation uh, you choose to purchase. But we can see that the latest model from last year has 51 kilobytes, which is a significant increase. And on the other hand, we had all along the uh, ST Micro Electronics ST33, which is also a fairly mature product, let's say. Uh, it has been around for quite some time now. I mean, definitely more than three, four years, significantly more. And it has over a hundred kilobytes and this is plenty of storage for private key material or for certificates, for user data, configuration data. Again, we're not talking megabytes. So it is uh, you advice to try to store a whole file there. But at the same time, you can store the symmetric cryptographic key, although there are better ways to do it, of course. Uh, you can encrypt it using the TPM. I'm just trying to suggest here that um, having that storage gives you a lot of possibilities how to increase the security of the system, including the TPM's NVRAM has some special properties that we will look in a later lecture. I'll just mention that uh, we can use the NVRAM as a secure counter. We can use it as an additional uh, platform configuration register, something that we'll discuss in the advanced TPM course. So this memory size is limited, but it is plenty to provide better security. At the same time, be advised that using it as a common secure storage is not a good approach. The last situation when a TPM is not suitable for use is when we need a standalone security solution. And this is again by design. This is not uh, some kind of a drawback, but rather it is the purpose of the TPM to be a passive device. We need a host device that sends comments to the TPM to perform different operations. What this gives us is a high security route of trust. And once ownership is established between the host and the TPM, then we can le leverage this route of trust for storage, for reporting, and so on. Now, there are different flavors of a TPM, of course, but all of these are passive. We can look at uh, some alternative solutions, like for example, Open Titan which has a TPM mode. At the same time, Open Titan can be an active device. An active device means that it can operate by itself. It can have its own logic, perform, for example, it can perform a hash and make a decision based on this hash. While with the TPM, we would send a comment from our main software or main CPU or secure isolated uh, trusted execution environment. And it would say to the TPM, hey, please compute hash over this data or sign digitally this message and then we would send over the digest the signature over some communication channel or make the decision in the secure software or on the main cpu and so on and so on so there is a important difference here and when first seeing the tpm as a security solution you might 
think that it, it is something that can be used standalone, but this is not the case. This is by design and it is important to remember this, especially if uh, this is your first experience with the TPM. That being said, we don't know what the future holds fully. There could be one day TPM 3.0 and it could have some kind of a mode switch to move from passive to active, but this too would be a speculation at, at this point. Um, for now, if you purchase a TPM, it is 100% in all cases passive device. Doesn't matter if it's a UFI module, firmware version, or a discrete chip solution. In summary, if you don't need significant cryptographic acceleration, but you do need high guarantees for the security of your product, of your system, then the TPM is a great fit. If you don't need a significant amount of secure storage, but you're okay with having encryption as the system starts or on demand and the keys for that encryption can be protected by the TPM, then again, the TPM is a really good fit. If you need a very fast access to your disk and encrypt and decrypt or your storage on the fly, then maybe it's best to look for uh, in an integrated solution, either some kind of an encrypted SSD that has actually a TPM built in and does all of these operations for you or some other types of solution. But typically TPM is very good at providing you key infrastructure to protect your encryption keys and then unlocking bits of the system or the whole system. This is how Microsoft BitLocker works. So for secure storage, the TPM has its purposes just do not intend to use the non-volatile memory of the TPM as the one and only secure storage. Be prepared to have artifacts and data outside the TPM that is protected, is encrypted by the TPM. That being said, you know, using TPM keys uh, and so on and so on. That being said, the last piece, if you're looking for an active device, for an active solution where it can just work by itself, uh, you are intending to write your own program or logic and you just want to put it in a TPM, unfortunately, that's not possible. There are some customization options regarding algorithms, but having your own logic inside a TPM, this is not something possible at this moment with TPM 2.0 and it is intended. So the TPM is a passive device. You need to have a host, CPU, MCU, something to issue comments to the TPM take ownership of the TPM hierarchies and operate it. The logic lives with a secure trusted execution environment, memory isolated process, or some other form of host. Now that we've covered why not to use TPM and all the other cases are very likely a good fit, I would like to go over again why the TPM has advantages over other solutions like a secure element or maybe some other forms of uh, HSM like smart cards, which are quite common even nowadays. I really like the fact that the TPM has a built-in protection against machine in the middle attacks. Of course, this protection needs to be enabled and we have a whole lecture and exercises on this topic. It is often that in uh, off the shelf devices, OEMs and OS vendors do not enable this protection early on or forget to enable it all together. But this is not a fault of the TPM architecture or design. This is not a fault of the TPM vendors. It is something that we need to be aware that there is a protection we think we just need to enable it. Another big benefit of the TPM is that once you create your solution, the TPM uses a standardized common set. The Trusted Computing Group has built the specification. It's publicly available. And you have the guarantee that if you change your TPM vendor, your application, your solution, solution would work the same way. Of course, there could be variances in the algorithm or maybe a bit in the speed as we saw uh, on the benchmarking slide, but mm, the operations should work exactly the same way and you would get the same result and the same security guarantees. One major difference that often uh, becomes overlooked is that the physical tamper protection of a TPM and we would need to look closer at the data sheets but usually it's significantly higher level than what secure elements offer. And comparing the prices, I think it's better to opt for a TPM when um, higher security needs exist. I already mentioned there are several TPM vendors in the world. I wanted to visualize that they are placed in uh, different places of the world. And of course, there's a worldwide supply chain. Some of these TPM vendors have plants, factories in two 
to fabricate uh, the silicon chips in different places, uh, US, Germany, and so on. And this gives you flexibility. It gives you some kind of a redundancy, which I think is important in um, today's world of creating Internet of Things devices, where we need to have parts to substitute in case something happens. And the TPM offers this, which is a great advantage compared to if you're using a um, secure element and you decide to switch from one vendor to the other, it will be a completely different common set. It might even be a different bus. So in this case, this really lowers your cost and it allows, again, your solution to just work. What you had, let's say, with an Infineon TPM would work the same way with an ST TPM, and what you had with a Nubuton TPM would work the same way with an Infineon TPM. There are very, very rare cases where this will not be true. And having this mature market also guarantees the supply chain, which is very important in recent days. And the last bit from the developer's perspective, from the time to market perspective, again, is that the software stack that provides us the interface to the TPM is also very flexible. We have variety of libraries, as we already saw, and they cover everything from server cloud situation to Internet of Things bare metal application. Depending on what you need, you can just choose the software stack you like, get TPM from the vendor that you prefer, closest to you or fastest, or maybe has the uh, largest non-volatile memory and start working. And if in a later version you need TPM with less memory, you can just switch to TPM and it just works. I think this is a major, major benefit when comparing TPM with any other HSM solutions out there. Here are the software libraries and just quickly going through this, uh, we have the TPM2 TSS, which follows the TCG specification. This is the only stack that conforms with the Trusted Computing Group specification. It offers three different types of API, the IBM TSS, uh, which comes in C programming language. It comes also with its own set of tools. Then we have the Go TPM, originally created by Google. Now, contribute, now a lot of people are contributing and companies, of course, best for cloud and servers. Wolf TPM, designed for bare metal, can be used in rich systems as well. As you can see on the right side of the table, all of these stacks can be used under Windows and Linux. And when I say Linux, I need probably to mention also this includes Mac OS. In some situations, it you might need to tweak a bit the build command at first, but uh, this is fairly well documented. Uh, for example, I remember very well the IBM stack has a documentation where there is a specific paragraph that just says, use this make file for Mac and it works. So the last one, not to forget the Microsoft build TPM stack. I would definitely recommend this stack if you're in a Windows environment. I had such a situation with a customer, a car manufacturer, and this was the natural choice. So this flexibility is what I was talking about. Depending on your situation, you can choose the best library for you. This is not the case with secure elements. Typically, you have one or two options, maybe one from the vendor and one an external project, and uh, this gives you the flexibility to develop quicker and to migrate between platforms as your products mature and grows and has next versions and so on. We've already covered good use cases for the TPM. I just want to reiterate some real life scenarios where we've seen an increasing use of X509 certificates and the TPM can be used to back such operations as the certificate signing request which you know are vital during provisioning, during rights revocation, and various operations in the life cycle of a device, of any system really. On the other hand, we have the TPM sealing capabilities either of arbitrary data or whole files, or we can seal against the state of the system and then only unlock the encrypting key for a hard drive, meaning that we can actually lock down the system against unauthorized use or against a system that is different from what it was from its good known state. This is very often um, a TPM, very, very common TPM application, TPM use case. And uh, of course, I really want to highlight the possibility to use a TPM backed keys to establish TOS connection, which further increases the security of this protection against machine in the middle over the internet. The TPM secure storage has 
plenty of room usually to store uh, several certificates, to store multiple, multiple LV counters, non-volatile counters, which we save between power cycles and only with property payment authorization we can use that. There's a use case uh, with taxi drivers actually where the taxis are supplied with a device that uses a TPM to count the mileage that has been covered. There are other use cases for trucks and whatnot, but the counter itself could be just an indicator for various events that have occurred. And this could be tracking temperature of medical devices while shipping or something else. Really, it could be opening the door when the door should have been closed. Then the TPM and VRAM uh, might not be large in size. And I keep repeating this because it is important to remember but we can use it to store sensitive data. Now, I've seen examples in my career where it's tempting to just store a symmetric key there, and that's okay depending how it is designed, but better is to use the TPM keys to encrypt this symmetric key, but that's also one way to go about this. Sometimes I've seen certificates that are needed to authenticate. I've seen some kind of a license structure also being kept the DPMs and VRAM and not being unlocked unless given states are met or uh, given authorization. So there are many, many applications for the TPM secure storage. The TPM secure storage has plenty of room usually to store uh, several certificates, to store multiple, multiple LV counters, non-volatile counters, which we save between power cycles and only with proper TPM authorization we can use that. There's a use case uh, with taxi drivers, actually, where the taxis are supplied with a device that uses a TPM to count the mileage that has been covered. There are other use cases for trucks and whatnot, but the counter itself could be just an indicator for various events that have occurred. And this could be tracking temperature of medical devices while shipping or something else, really. It could be opening the door when the door should have should have been closed. Then the TPM and VRAM uh, might not be large in size, and I keep repeating this because it is important to remember, but we can use it to store sensitive data. Now, I've seen examples in my career where it's tempting to just store a symmetric key there, and that's okay depending how it is designed, but better is to use the TPM keys to encrypt this symmetric key, but that's also one way to go about this. Sometimes I've seen certificates that are needed to authenticate. I've seen some kind of a license structure also being kept in the DPMs and VRAM and not being unlocked unless given states are met or uh, given authorization. So there are many, many applications for the TPM secure storage. I think this is something special about the TPM compared to other HSM that it has a separate route of trust for reporting. This comes from the endorsement hierarchy, which provides us unique machine identity. It can be used as a mach unique machine identity. And from there, we can generate different cryptographic proofs. Uh, would that be a, just a digital signature? Would it be something more like a hash and then a signature or directly the TPM2 quote that we will look in the advanced TPM class? I think this is a major advantage of the TPM security capabilities to compare the system state to its golden state. And maybe we verify just the configuration of the system or maybe we verify a whole um, partition that holds, let's say, the application or a folder. There are many, many use cases of this feature. Now, another interesting aspect of the TPM's uh, root of trust is that uh, it has a common and a way to certify that keys originated from a specific TPM or that, that this TPM key is right now loaded into the system. Uh, this is very important for some sensitive operations like firmware upgrade, or again, transferring important parameters to your system, to your device. It could be licensing. This is uh, something I see people come uh, as a first thought often. There are way more use cases than licensing when we need to think about the TPM. Again, parameters for industrial machines. This is critical information. Licensing is just a natural thing for this, but it's definitely much more valuable to secure and protect the configuration parameters that we enter industrial equipment to avoid incidents, to avoid malicious attacks. So I think the proofs 
that we can generate using the TPM. If a certain key is present, if a certain operation took place, if a certain state of the system is true at this moment, not just at the start of the system, but right now, this gives us a higher security level and we can then safely proceed with, let's say, new parameterization of the industrial equipment or of the automated crane and Including, uh, we had a situation at uh, TPM.dev once where uh, I think it was the third largest automi automated car wash company was looking to integrate TPMs into their systems. In summary, we need to remember that TPMs are passive devices. They need a host, they need a program, preferably living in a secure environment or memory isolated environment that sends commands to the TPM. TPM cannot act on its own. And there are standards by the TCG. There is uh, functional testing to provide evidence that how the TPM operates so we can trust it there. There is a mechanism to verify that the TPM is genuine. And we'll talk about this a bit later. The TPM has non-volatile memory that is very useful because of the TPM authorization and the protection that the TPM has as a physical chip. At the same time, we need to select carefully what we store there because of its limited size, uh, we can get over 100 kilobytes, which is a lot for sensitive data. In most situations, this is more than enough. And we can use the TPM as a bridge, as just a step to decrypting our sensitive file storage or partition or external drive and so on. And if you need something more specific, you can always get an integrated solution. Usually if you take an SSD that can has uh, encryption decryption built in, it comes actually already with the TPM. So the TPM is a really good solution for secure storage. Just be mindful of its NVRAM size. And last but not least, compared to other HSM solutions, the TPM is very affordable and provides higher physical tamper protection, higher side channel attacks protection. And I think it's worth looking into that a TPM when comparing with secure elements and other similar solutions.